In one sense, mind is like the rear view mirror of a car. Or for psychologists, uh, uh, the one way mirror. Uh, mind is really excellent for looking backwards uh, with a tremendous amount of hindsight, uh, often mistaken for clarity and understanding, which we later understand it really is not. But in any case, with a certain sense of confidence, uh, when we turn the instrument to the back. And when we reverse the direction and look forward, uh, in the words of the Indian sage Sri Aurobindo, uh, we can't see even the step in front, the very next moment. Uh, this dilemma, uh, the human dilemma, is, was dramatically illustrated for us by what happened in 1989 September, in a discussion between Mikhail Gorbachev and German Chancellor Kohl, Roman Kohl, where they were talking about the future of Germany. Two people who probably were better positioned than anyone else in the world to have an idea of what was going to come. And in their private conversations, they shared the view that German reunification was inevitable. The only question is when it would happen. And they were also remarkably together in their estimate. They said it's inevitable, but it won't happen for at least 20 or 30 years. And yet, <coughs> within a couple of months officially, there was no Berlin Wall, though of course it was already tumbling for those in hindsight we see. And in a year, it was de facto a reality. Uh, so, we are used to the fact that when we look forward, we really are looking into a cloud of obscurity. Uh, and yet, our constant temptation and urge is to look forward, uh, because that's where we're going. In, at the turn of the 20th century, that is 117 years ago, there was widespread speculation that with the growth of industry and development and international trade and all, that we had really witnessing the end of war. That was before World War I and before World War II. Uh, things that we re-echo uh, today in the modern era. When Adam Smith published uh, Wealth of Nations, he had a small section there where he talked about the future of America at a time when Europe really discounted the future of this group of colonies and colonists, mostly the refuse from Europe that was looking for some place uh, where they could uh, do something on the soils of America. And yet he saw and predicted that within a hundred years, America would be the largest economy in the world, the most powerful, which was an absurdity uh, at that time uh, in 1776 uh, when Wealth of Nations was published. Uh, at the end of the Cold War, when so much was going on and our view of the world was radically changing, uh, how many of us who lived through that great dramatic period Imagine, as recently as 1990 or 92 or 93, that we would be witness to the birth of perhaps what could be called the first global social institution, the internet, and that the world would be so radically changed in its interconnections and relationships. Uh, not in 25 years, but actually it started much uh, faster. One of the members of our board, Herwood Schoper, was the Director General of CERN at that time, when Tim Berners-Lee actually came forward with the proposal. Uh, and not only within CERN, but even in Brussels, said, well, it's very interesting technology, but we don't really see what, uh, you know, that we need it. Uh, our views have changed. Yet, in spite of this blindness to the future, and there are countless examples that you can all think of, uh, anticipation has and continues to play an extremely important role uh, in determining what happens. 
Uh, the idea of abolishing war seemed uh, fantastic a hundred years ago, and even after two world wars, uh, it, uh, it looked fantastic in 1945, uh, whether, whether we could really do that. And yet, in spite of the local skirmishes and civil wars that we have seen in regional conflicts, in fact, uh, the prospects of a major global conflagration look uh, decreasingly likely. The idea of founding the UN was presaged by the League of Nations uh, in the, after World War I, which was a stillborn in some respects, extremely limited, uh, but it led to its sequel, the United Nations, for all of the imperfections that we see today. And there's something we can learn from the process by which these institutions have developed over time. We had the great visionaries like Schumann and Monet who envisioned the idea of a united Europe, which certainly looked like utopian dreams when they were first expressed. Uh, and uh, yet has created uh, the greatest experiment, I believe, in uh, human unity, the first really enormous and viable experiment to transcend the consciousness of the nation state. It's natural, given the precariousness of our fourth sight, that science, social science, should look as far as possible for its truth and certainty in the past. And imitating the tendencies of the natural sciences, which grew out of a study of natural laws and factual evidence, social science has tended, by and large, over the last century, to really look for the truths of the future and what's happened in the past, in the laws of the past, the principles of the past, the tendencies of the past, uh, uh, and uh, because we want some certainty, and by knowledge we tend to think that uh, certainty is the, the, the sign that we really know what we're talking about. Uh, but no matter how much we've attempted to find certainty in the past, the future avoids us, evades us, evades our ground. It's evanescent. And I think uh, my argument will be that until we fully embrace the full implications of what is implied and uh, spelled out by the study of anticipation, uh, this is really the next step. It's not just the next step in history or political science or in any particular field. It's the next step in the evolution of our knowledge. And so uh, it represents a sea change. And in my remarks, I'd like to explain uh, uh, some of the implications of the discussion that we're having here today, the implications for the work that the World Academy is doing, and I think that all of you are doing in different fields. Uh, and some of this from one perspective, if we don't look at actually uh, what's being done today in many fields, it's self-evident. It's self-evident to the non-academician who uh, runs their life. It's self-evident that we live in a triple dimension of time. That everything we do is influenced by the past and the habits and fixity of the past, the traditions of the past, the institutions established in the past. Our own behavior is so much guided by our past experience, our personal and racial memory. We look at the present circumstances and the present uh, uh, conditions and pressures and opportunities that we're aware of. And we also look to our expectations, our goals, our aspirations, our hopes, and our fears about the future. And the question is, uh, how do we process this triple time dimension in our understanding, in our knowledge, and particularly our knowledge about the future? And the data that we have in these three is quite ambiguous. There's recently been a, a movement in the field of history, very interesting, work over the last 25 years 
by people like John Darwin, the English historian, and many others in different fields who are reviewing or rediscovering, or maybe we could say reinventing the history, reinventing the history of the last 500 years. Uh, seeing that the process of globalization and the story that was told by history and historians for five centuries about the rise of the West and the elements of Western civilization, the Protestant ethic, the, the birth of democracy, the industrial revolution and all that explain the inevitable supremacy of the West in its rise. The revisiting by historians is telling a very different story. That actually the process of globalization preceded the movement for a democratic revolution in Europe. It preceded uh, uh, the industrial revolution by many centuries. And if we look back to the situation in the 13th, 14th, 15th century, we see that the most developed nations in the world, and indeed even those that were uh, most aggressive in their efforts at globalization, were countries like civilizations like China and India. Uh, it, it's hard to remember after the Industrial Revolution that in the 16th and 17th century, Indian cotton textiles were the prized, rare, precious possession in Europe. Before the Industrial Revolution dramatically reduced the cost of cotton, uh, cotton processing by 90%, uh, 99% at one time, uh, they, they were so rare, precious, and expensive. Uh, China had an extensive network of global trade, extending uh, quite far all the way up to the uh, borders of Europe and that. In any case, the details aren't important. What's important is history has discovered that our view of the past uh, was very much distorted by the cultural uh, events and ideology that grew up in Europe in the last few hundred years and really only reached its peak about 130 years ago. Even as recently as 1875, most Europeans had very little conception that European nations would be dominating the world in a global empire. And of course, that's easy for today's youth to perceive because if you talk about the European empires today, they look around and say, who? Where? <laughs> I once made the mistake in a meeting about 20 years ago of uh, referring to that with uh, intending it as a positive statement. Imagine this tiny little island nation of Britain uh, spreading out all over the world. And uh, my British colleague was somewhat offended that anybody could think of uh, Britain as a tiny, because he still thought of it in terms of a, a global empire. So, we are constantly reconceptualizing the past and drawing new conclusions and understanding about it. Uh, it's very interesting to hear the discussion on nuclear weapons, an issue that was of uh, immense importance to the founders of the World Academy, which included Albert Einstein and Joe, uh, Joe Roblock, who won the Nobel Prize for his work on disarmament, and Robert Oppenheimer, who uh, who led the Manhattan Project to the, develop the weapons. It's interesting now when you hear about the debate because there are two sides. One is that we managed by the skin of our teeth uh, to uh, avoid mutually assured destruction during the Cold War and now we have to move beyond it. And then you hear with equal intensity and conviction that it was only because of mutually assured uh, destruction that we have avoided uh, war. So our view of the past and interpretation of the past is of immense significance in determining our view of the future, our attitudes towards it, and our justifications for what we're doing. Then, if that's true of what's already happened, how much more it must be true of our conceptualization of the future, of our anticipation, expectations, uh, and fears of the future. Uh, what does the past tell us about the 21st century? Is this going to be the Asian century? Is it going to be the global century? Is it going to be something we haven't conceived or not? My second related point is that, because what I have said is 
self-evident and obvious to all of us in our personal life. But I'd like to also argue that the importance of anticipation is increasing over time. Not in absolute terms. Human beings have always looked forward. They have always expected whether they were anticipating something good or bad, uh, Armageddon or something, uh, uh, or heaven on earth. Uh, but that uh, we are changing. We are evolving as a species. And we have what I would call three primary modes or levels of consciousness. We live physically, biologically, we live physically, bound by the constraints of the past, by our habits. Uh, we grow up eating certain types of food, we get used to a particular climate, we learn a particular language when we're young, we learn traditions, we have past experience that powerfully molds us and orients our present activities towards a continuation of the past. We also have a consciousness, uh, Shirobindo called it vital, the life consciousness that's driven by urges and desires, uh, which is very much influenced by immediate gratification, by the, con the immediate pressure uh, of the circumstance or opportunity of the moment. And we have a mental consciousness that is not grounded or limited. It's certainly influenced by both of these dimensions, but it's not limited by that. It's capable of detaching itself from experience, detaching itself even from the environment, and imagining things that aren't there. But my point is that this mix, this balance between the three time zones or the three dimensions of human consciousness is changing. I believe we are much more mental today than humanity was in the past. We much more rely on exercising our minds, organizing our knowledge. Uh, we put our youth through a rigorous discipline for 12 or 15 or 20 years of primarily using their energy mentally rather than physically, rather than on the battlefield, rather than just uh, competitively striving. And that this marks an evolution which can be seen in all the institutions, uh, the social institutions today. The very fact that our economy today is much more a service economy based on the exchange of intangibles and not the kind of economy that Adam Smith conceived a few hundred years ago when agriculture was considered primary food is the most primary thing, and then manufacturing. Uh, so this has implications. If there's a truth in this, and I, I welcome a, a, a debate and some provocation on it, but if there's a truth in the fact that we are becoming more mental, it means that our view of the future, our capacity to understand the future, uh, and the processes by which the future influences us are more important than ever before. One of the, the, the themes uh, of our conference here today, discussion, is complexity, and complexity goes hand in hand with uncertainty. Uh, and is the world really more uncertain today, or is it just that our understanding, we're more aware of uh, the inherent uncertainty uh, uh, today? The, Efforts of human beings to anticipate the future is nothing new, obviously. And those of you, like Roberto, who, and many of you I know who have been working as, in future studies for uh, decades, and Eleanor Massini, who uh, uh, was one of the, the visionaries in this field, uh, know how much effort there has been in defining different approaches, tools, and methodologies to help us look forward. Uh, to help us conceptualize what the future may be, forecast it, have foresight uh, into it. But I think, and I think the intention of those who have been pushing for recognition of anticipation as a discipline uh, are saying something more than that. We're not only saying that it's important to look forward and study the future, 
but we're trying to understand the impact of the future, the pull of the future on the present. And uh, depending on how, and I'm sure we'll be discussing it, uh, how we envision, how can something that doesn't exist act on us now? Is it really our conception of the future that's acting? Uh, uh, our present conception of a future that's determining our behavior, which of course we would, I think, all agree with, or is it uh, uh, something else? And this raises the second, what I think is the very second important point about our discussions here. And that is, the very fact that we're discussing anticipation compels us to recognize the importance of the subjective dimension in the social sciences and human affairs. Something again which is self-evident to us as human beings, our feelings, our thoughts, our fears, our aspirations, we know that intuitively uh, that they are important. And yet so much of the history of social sciences has been built on trying to objectify uh, this process and explain ourselves to ourselves in terms of external social structures or past experience uh, as if we are as, as determined in our behavior in one sense as the missile launched according to Newtonian laws of motion uh, in, in, and its predictability in terms of where to go. In War and Peace, Tolstoy used a phrase, he dwelled on this subjective factor in human affairs when he was talking about uh, one of the famous, the, anticipating the most famous battles between the, the uh, Napoleon's armies invading Russia and the, the Russian response, he referred to the intangible element called, which he called the spirit of the army. The unpredictability of the future in terms of how many soldiers you have, how much ammunition you have, how your logistics are, or even how advantageous your positioning is, it is simply not possible because there is a subjective factor that can be more important than all of the uh, objective factors. Shakespeare portrayed this beautifully in uh, his play Henry V in his uh, description of the Battle of Agincourt and uh, Henry V's famous uh, speech on St. Crispin's Day. Uh, a historical fact, no doubt dramatized uh, for English uh, historical patriotism, but a historical fact of a small group of weary, battle-worn uh, knights uh, overcoming a, a, a force estimated at three to five times greater of troops that were uh, battle fresh, and, uh, fresh and, and battle ready. Uh, when Germany invaded Britain in the beginning of the Battle of Britain, the estimates were of the German military and the high command was that this war would be over, or the battle would be over within three months, and once England surrenders, after all, there's not much left of Europe uh, to put up a fight. And yet, within three months, it wasn't the, the British that surrendered, it was the Germans that withdrew. Uh, and imagine when Winston Churchill got on the radio and announced to the British Parliament, the British people, and the rest of the world that we will never surrender. Uh, he didn't say, I hope we won't surrender. <laughs> he didn't do a straw vote or a referendum like for Brexit and ask, do you agree with me that we shouldn't surrender? He announced on behalf of the people and the world that we will never surrender. And in fact, I think, uh, I personally believe that if it had been anyone else in that position, uh, if it had been Chamberlain or Baldwin or somebody else, the outcome of the, the Battle of Britain and of World War II could have been dramatically different than it was. So uh, we know that the subjective is of immense importance to us in the decisions we make in our capacity for accomplishment. And yet in social sciences, we have downplayed it to a bare minimum, found lip service for it, and I think even done something more serious we are now attempting to explain it all in terms of neuro, neurobiology and neurophysiology and reducing ourselves entirely to uh, 
uh, uh, to uh, uh, genetics uh, and electrochemical devices. So this is a really serious subject because if we take it seriously, it forces us to re-examine underlying premises that are there in all the social sciences. One other dramatic example of the importance of the subject in another field of social science economics where we're doing a lot of work, uh, which so much is trying to reduce itself to a set of mathematical formulas and quantifiable uh, phenomena, uh, was what happened in 1933 when FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, became the president of the U.S. four years after the Great Crash in the middle of the greatest economic downturn that had ever taken place or has taken place uh, since then. Uh, the, we had 6,000 American banks that had failed because of efforts to manage the financial system through prevailing economic theory. Uh, Roosevelt said uh, he had studied economics at Harvard and found that nothing he had learned had prepared him to take up this situation. And uh, he got on the radio six days after becoming president and he said, on Monday morning, I'm going to reopen the banks. When he had closed the banks on becoming president, there were lines miles long of people, depositors lining up to withdraw their money before the banks failed. And of course, even the most viable bank in the world would soon fail if all the depositors came. And uh, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And he said, I'm going to open the banks up on Monday, and I want you to go back to the bank. I want you to go back and stand in line at the bank, but I want you to redeposit your money. Take your savings that you've withdrawn and put it back. And he said his famous words at that time, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. It is fear that's undermining the American economy, not our banking system, not our, we have the same raw materials, natural resources, productive factories, a skilled workforce, it's, it's strictly a phenomenon, a psychological, subjective phenomenon that's underlying, that's undermining the entire objective functioning of the economic system. And of course, all economists know that at the foundation of our system are the intangibles like trust. Without trust, there's no trade. Without trust, there's no money. Without trust, there's no banking. Without trust, there's no government unless you're, there's certainly no democratic government. One of our uh, uh, outstanding <laughs> former presidents of the World Academy, Harlan Cleveland, uh, uh, back in the early 50s, he was working on development, America, uh, uh, representative of US development in uh, the Far East, and he coined a phrase uh, which became so famous that it became uh, went into Bartlett's familiar quotations. He, he saw there's a revolution of rising expectations awakening in Asia after the end of the Second World War. And this is going to alter the future. These expectations are a more powerful determinant of what's going to happen than the physical circumstances and the ravages of war. And of course, it's no coincidence that Germany and Japan, which were really ravaged by war, recovered so quickly because their infrastructure had been destroyed, but their aspirations uh, uh, had not been. Uh, Edgar Morin, uh, uh, in talking about systems, insists on reminding us that systems have a physical dimension, but they also have a psychological dimension. And so I think, I'm stressing this point because I think it's so important that we need to be able to revisit all theory in the social sciences to ask not only whether we've understood the pull of the past or the present or the future, but equally, have we fully understood the underlying importance of the subjective dimension in human behavior and affairs. Third uh, point that I think is very important and has profound implications 
Another area where the academy is working and feels uh, very important to work is on the implica implications for dealing with human existence as if we can be understood and studied in terms of compartmentalized fields. Anticipation compels us, and it's not the only thing compelling us, but it compels us to think much more in terms of the integration of human behavior, the, uh, the, it, the interactions and interdependence between all the dimensions which, for the convenience of, ac of intellectuality and academia or government management, we divide into political and economic and social and anthropological, cultural, or military, or uh, uh, other environments. And I think one of the important things that systems, development of systems theory has done uh, has to emphasize the fact that not only are there characteristics that transcend particular fields, and the, uh, the attraction and importance of system theory has been because it has really uh, helped us to identify patterns that cross many disciplines, but also there are some common underlying principles, which I would call transdisciplinary principles that are applicable to all fields of human study. And the work we've been doing in the academy, one of our conclusions and arguments has been that the future of the social sciences has to be much more on the development of those transdisciplinary foundations. And that's why looking at the interdependence between different sectors, what we think of as different sectors, we're all only individual human beings. We live in multiple dimensions of time. We live in multiple fields of existence. Uh, that we're going to need to really look more and more at what those transdisciplinary foundations are. Is the future dependent on our view of it today, or does the future really attract us? It's a controversial, interesting, uh, philosophically interesting uh, issue. I think the safest bet would be to take uh, uh, the work I've read from Roberto on, we have a thick present and the future is somehow there in our conception, and certainly it is. But just to be a little more provocative, I'd like to take a view uh, and an idea from uh, complexity theory that the future is really an attractive. And that it's not just what we know about it, not just what we think about it, but it has a compelling force of an attractor uh, to pull us in particular directions. Uh, and it's got a magnetism and it's got a momentum. Uh, this uh, was very clearly dramatized in my own understanding when I was preparing for the first meeting that Roberto invited me to in Switzerland quite about three years ago. Uh, 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 and, uh, and I was working on some issues regarding civil rights. I had just read a very fascinating biography of Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War. Uh, and I was thinking about the issue of we actually fought a war in the U.S. To abolish slavery in from 1860 uh, around 1860 1862 1865, but if you look at the history from 1700 up until 1860, virtually every year you can find a very interesting uh, history historiography uh, Wikipedia on this. Almost every year, a country is announcing and taking legal action to either ban slavery at home or ban the slave trade. And even in the US, most of the northern colonies had made slavery illegal 50 years or 70 years before. And yet we actually had some people in the South who thought we should extend slavery to the new territories as we expand across the country. It took 150 years to say what we had in the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal, really included black men. It didn't include women because they didn't get the right to vote until uh, 1922. Uh, and it took another 100 years before we had the American Civil Rights Movement and uh, uh, to make it more of the fact that we're still fighting for it today. Uh, but we are not just a product of the past that urbanism. 
If we look to the future, I doubt anywhere in the world that they seriously doubt which direction we're going in with regard to ethnicity, with regard to race, with regard to culture, with regard to sex and other things. I like to think of values as attractors. Uh, they are not just based on our previous experience. They're not just based on our present conception. There's a compelling urge to move towards greater freedom. Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, in his famous book on democracy in America, uh, said the most, if you look back for 700 years, the most significant trend is the increasing movement towards equality. And every major development, whether it was the Reformation, even though he was French, or the printing press, or the firearms, or anything, help, was helping society, or the collapse of aristocracy, was helping uh, in a long-term direction. So I think it's worth debating this issue, not just for philosoph out of philosophical interest, but to understand uh, what is the compelling force of uh, the future that may be uh, leading us. And I'm going to, uh, already taking too long, so I'm going to abbreviate my uh, further remarks. But I think that uh, this topic, I'm trying to say how, why I think this is so important. I think this is also important fundamentally in the social sciences for uh, uh, asking the question of what is causality. And not only to help us explain to really have a theory of human causality, both at the individual and the collective level, but equally or more important, because social sciences are not just here to describe nature as it exists. Uh, as Karl Popper said, uh, the purpose of the social sciences is to improve our existence, is to give us a knowledge that we can use to improve our existence. He <coughs> cautioned against uh, uh, excessive, deter uh, 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 excessive focus on determinisms of the past and excessive influence of the natural sciences. Beware of misguided application of naturalism in the social uh, sciences. But social sciences are really about accomplishment. Uh, we are really trying to under, have a knowledge that will help us accomplish more effectively in the future, whether it's for achieving security or political uh, uh, freedom or social harmony or ecological sustainability, uh, whatever it is. And I don't think we have any prayer of achieving an effective theory of causality and accomplishment unless we fully understand not only the importance of the future, but the increasing importance and increasing role and influence of the future in what we do. And so in that sense, anticipation fills a critical gap in social theory and is the leading edge maybe of a much broader movement of uh, uh, how I would like to anticipate the social science evolving in the future that affirms that uh, the determinative influence of subjective, social, psychological, cultural, and other factors, the liberation of our future from the karma, I can't, I spend a lot of time, from the karma of social determinisms in the past. And what our challenge is, is to find out what this balance is and what this process is and how this mix is evolving and how we can utilize this knowledge more effectively in the future. Thank you.